really happy to be here. My name is Sean Kent and I work for Mass Audubon and I run the education programs for their Metro South region and that's the Blue Hills Trailside Museum which is right here and this is a this is a this is a video of the otter that's there in the new exhibit and this is from yesterday during the snowstorm right there and then here it is right there going into the water right through there and that is we just opened that up in October I'll just go back to this picture actually uh, in October it's about a 2.4 million dollar renovation of the otter exhibit and turtle enclosure so She's there and she's really, really friendly. So she'll come right up to the glass a lot of times and you'll see her really well. And it's, it's, a, it's both uh, aquatic, there's also slides in there for her to go into the water, but there's also a lot of uh, upland, like native plants and everything in there. It's really, really nice yeah. that just opened up. And the outside exhibits are always free, so you can just walk in uh, 10 to 4.30 is when the gates are open there wow. through that. And then I also, uh, work at the Museum of American Bird Art, which is in Canton, which is a 125-acre wildlife sanctuary, along with art studio space. We're going to be opening up a community like kind of space and maker space there and in a few months with pottery studios and summer camps. And then two other wildlife sanctuaries, one in Sharon called Moose Hill, which is Mass Audubon's oldest, and that's about 2,000 acres, and we're going to be having a lot of maple sugaring events going on over the next month there, uh, a maple sugaring festival on March 12th and 13th, and then individual programs called Tapetry, where you can go out and Tapetry, and the festival is uh, just a maple sugaring tours through the whole operation. And that's again on March uh, 12th and 13th. And then a little bit farther away is Stony Brook Wildlife Sanctuary, which is in Norfolk, and that's about 250 acres, a combination between the state and Mass Audubon with a really extensive boardwalk system that goes right through wetlands and stuff that's really lovely as well. And I'm also, uh, a field biologist with my graduate work that I've done a lot of work on native bees and native plants and the monarch butterfly there too. But today what I want to talk about to you here is uh, birds that you will mostly can see in your backyard or in the Quincy area around here and I'm happy to answer any questions during the presentation and at the end and a lot of the photographs in this are photos that I've taken so I can talk to them like in particular here. So I thought we could kind of hop in and get started with the red-tailed hawk right here and start looking at um, some of the common backyard or birds in your area and start also giving you a little bit of their kind of songs and what to like start listening for because at the new year and as the days start to get a little bit longer, if you can start to just kind of when you're walking around and get a little more in tune with the birds that might be calling, you'll start to hear differences starting this time of year because they start to go into the kind of territory and mating type of calls. So we're going to come back to the black cat chickadee a lot through the talk to kind of guide us through here because it's a really amazing bird. But here's what it sounds like. So you can hear it going, sweetie, sweetie. And a lot of times it's going to be doing that when it's go either trying to attract a mate, kind of, set, kind of settle aside some territory there. But the chickadees are really wonderful because here's that red-tailed hawk again, and there's a picture of a chickadee. And this is a, the chickadee's actually drinking maple sap that's running off of a sugar maple when I took this picture, and I'll, I'll talk about that later. But birds are really amazing, and that's one of the reasons I talk about like the secret life of birds here is they have their whole kind of language they're able to communicate through these songs and when, you, they, when there's a hawk around or here's a coyote that, that was also, this is also a picture taken at uh, the Wildlife Sanctuary in Canton behind the Art Museum We've, in the 125 acres there in January and then here's another picture of a younger coyote in the meadow at the sanctuary in Canton and the chickadee, there was a chickadee, there were chickadees nearby, that's what I have the picture right here they make this call, okay, and that's the chickadee d d d call. And what they'll do is they'll change the tone and inflection and frequency and length of the call depending on whether it's a hawk, a coyote, in these examples, us. So they'll go chickadee d d d 
or they'll raise and lower, they'll chick a dee 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 dee, chick a dee dee dee, higher and lower, depending on what the call is, depending on what the predator is or what the threat level is. So they're distinguishing it between chickadees, but they're also able to distinguish that between uh, that communication goes to squirrels and chipmunks and other birds there. So they're able to kind of recognize threats and talk about, talk about them to each other through this one call. And by just raising and kind of lowering the tone and inflection or frequency, and you can call it any type of that before, but just changing that, they're able to communicate a whole diversity of threats or information to people. And you'll notice this even if you walk, you're walking by, and they might also be just communicating territory to each other there too. But it's a really wonderful system that, that these birds have. And black-capped chickadees will do this, but also other birds will kind of mix in here, but the chickadees are a really great example of able to using what would apparently be a simple song to communicate lots of information. So what I'll also show here is some other birds that you might see in the area and also their songs. So white-throated sparrows are winter residents. They are typically more northern, northern New England, Canada, and they migrate here to spend the winter here. And they sing a song like this. And so that's like, oh sweet Canada, 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 here. <laughs> and you can actually see it in this video here a lot more clearly than I want to show you by Lang Elliott. <laughs> and you'll start to hear that song end of March, beginning of April. And these are common uh, visitors to bird feeders and ground feeding spar uh, sparrows, especially near the coast, like in the Quincy area right here. And what's really neat about them is depending on where they are in the range, they actually change, their, their song is different. Sometimes it's Oh Sweet Canada, Canada too, or sometimes it's Oh Sweet Canada, Canada, Canada. And they're actually, <laughs> believe it or not, that's how these birds decide to mate whether or not and within the past 20 years, the whole song has changed rapidly throughout the entire range. Um, where there's a, there's a really quick example of like the evolution of like uh, song behavior um, between these birds. And if I played this video even more here, the bird actually sings Oh Sweet Canada, Canada, and then changes it to Oh Sweet Canada, Canada, Canada later on. See, that time it was three. And I think the next one, it's just going to be two. But I can't, I... See, it comes off to just two right there. But that's one bird that you can start to like kind of listen for as well too. Go ahead. The question is how there's different types of morphs of the white-throated sparrow. And where this part, right up here, kind of in this section, is going to be more lighter or darker in color. And this picture was just taken in some Francisca after a snowstorm. And this is later March, early April. And the top part of the feathers become much more distinct as they go into their breeding season, become much brighter, and they'll vary there too. But you, 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 can, you will see these around, and I, I find them, they're, they're typically more common in, in, in urban areas than kind of, not rural, but more suburban areas, especially near the coast. Another really great feeder bird that we have around here, and this is a ground feeding bird along with the white throat sparrow, so you see them more on the ground are these dark eyed juncos. And, this one, and these can really vary a lot in their color pattern too, but here's, here's their song. And so there, you can hear it's like a trill. You know, you had Oh Sweet Canada, 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 and then the <laughs> sweetie drawing out. But then other birds, it, there's these trills, so you hear the trill again, and I'm going to show, show a video of it in a second. You know, doesn't get higher, doesn't get lower, kind of stays the same the whole way through. And so as you start to hear those, you can start to put them in little categories, and just, just taking birds that you might hear, see around your feeders and hearing those songs uh, can make it easier. Is it open? Yeah, okay. And here's the video of the dark-eyed junco. 
I think. Yep. And so these would be in small flocks, anywhere between like five and twenty. Um, they migrate here during the winter, and then will migrate to their breeding ground more northern New England, Canada, uh, in the summertime. And so this is another bird. When you start to look, you'll probably start to see this in different areas in Quincy and in the surrounding area if you're not already familiar with it. And then just a few more birds that are really lovely. So then there's a song sparrow. This is here all year round. This doesn't migrate. It's got a really kind of more complicated song, but it's typically not shy. So you'll see this around on tops of trees or on tops of this again on reeds and cattails, on tops of flowers. Uh, and you'll find it a lot in kind of, uh, you know, urban environments. And here's its song. So you can see a lot of different values to that higher, lower, going up and down. But what I want to show you is the video so you can actually see it doing its song. Show that video again in a second, but also I wanted to highlight here, sparrows are really tough to identify, you know, when you see them from house sparrows and everything there. And the reason I like the song sparrow is they're calm, they're relatively common. They sing out in the open usually. They're not typically afraid and fly away from humans, as long as you don't get too close to it or bother it. And right here on their chest is a bright dot, not a bright dot, but it's a, it's a very conspicuous spot that is always going to be a song sparrow that other birds don't have that. So once you start to see it a little bit and then you start to see it's, you start to get familiar with its song, yeah, you see you're familiar with the song, you'll start to recognize it and the whole idea with these birds is to give you a few birds that you can start to work on both the songs getting familiar with those, and visually seeing them, then that will make learning more birds later on a lot more accessible there. Because you know it's so overwhelming when you look in the books and everything else, so you, especially with songs. Okay. And then just two more birds, and then we're going to go into kind of some more stories about birds through here. So this is a good friend of the chickadee. You'll see them in flocks together. This is a tufted titmouse. It, in this picture, I took this one at Mount Auburn Cemetery, you can see it's got a full beak. Those are all caterpillars. There's probably eight of them in, in its beak right there. Oh. On another angle from the other side, I counted eight. Here I can count six right through there. Uh, this was taken in May. And here's its song. And almost always within the first week of January, I start to hear it singing a little bit. And now it's becoming more and more. So again, it's kind of like a, sharp, a whistle, kind of goes up. It, it, if you listen to it, it's Peter, Peter, Peter. A lot of times you'll hear it. You can mix it up with the cardinal a little bit. But you'll hear these kind of like whistling sounds. And you'll hear these a lot earlier in the morning. They do call all throughout the day. But again, first week of February right now, they're going to start calling a lot more. The sound carries pretty well, so you can hear it in when you're outside going around. And then just one more time. So kind of that whistling. And then I just want to show you a video of it singing right here. Again, Peter, Peter, Peter. And you'll usually see these in flocks with chickadees and nuthatches as well. And then the last bird for a song to kind of work on is this tiny little Carolina wren. These have been, been becoming, over the past 20 years, much more common around here. They're very vocal, and they do really well around kind of like structures and people. Like we had one in Canton that nested in a kayak. 
Um, if there's a bird in your garage, it's probably this bird. You know, I'm saying other birds get in the garage, but these ones look for those areas and nest inside of those areas. And then this is a little bit like tea kettle, tea kettle, tea kettle. It's very loud. Carolina Wren. And there's some variation to it. There's another part. So just one more time. Carolina Wren. And I'm going to play a video of it too so you can see it making the call. But if you have brush piles or you're walking along an area where there's a lot of kind of brush and these kind of brown birds are really tiny, moving really, really fast. This time of year, you'll see them in threes, fours, and fives a lot of times. It's probably going to be a Carolina Wren. If you just sit and wait, it's probably going to come back out. But, you know, these, um, these are eating lots of insects and going through there. You can see it's curved bill there. But again, these do really well in the area and they're ones that you can see. And here's just a little video of it. So this is filmed, not, I didn't film this, but I'm pretty sure this is filmed with a GoPro right here that's sitting on um, a tray feeder. Birds will do a lot of call and responses to each other too. <laughs> yeah. So if you have a GoPro camera, this will be a good use for it too. I just want to play the call one more time. There, so you can see it with the first. I just want to play the song one more time. And so with the Carolina Wren call as well, along a little bit with the tufted titmouse there at the end, like they cut through a lot of noise. So even if you're walking on a busier street or there's a lot of like kind of ambient noise from cars or planes or whatever, these are loud enough where they'll cut through. And if you recognize kind of those like higher pitch, not so much of a whistle, but kind of those trill calls, these two birds are really Carolina good. Wren. These are two really good ones to train your ear. as an entryway to start even just recognizing bird songs because when I found when I first started doing this I didn't know really anything about birds or like I was surprised when I first saw a duck that wasn't a mallard when I, when I was living in in uh, in Brookline near Hall's Pond and I'm like well, what, what in the world is that I thought they were just mallards like ducks like this is something different it kind of opened a whole new world with these if you can find one or two birds if you want to be if you want to be more interested in this that allow you to kind of like start to learn their song the other noise, like kind of natural noises, will start to make a little bit more sense and give you an accessible way to learn those over time, as opposed to just trying to learn 50 bird songs that all sound the same. It's not a good way to go. And then with the Carolina Wren and the Titmouse and the other birds, you'll start to see like the, there's different, there's really three or four major patterns to bird songs, where they're the, the simple trills running through there, they're complex songs, or they rise and they fall. And if you start to pull the pieces of that out, then you'll be like, oh, that's something different. And at least it's, I know it's not this, and it's a, it's a nice way to, um, to start. Okay. All right, so we're gonna go back to our friend the chickadee here and kind of look through like surviving in winter and kind of look through, through that. And it's pretty much a simple thing as in, as in don't freeze and don't starve uh, for birds trying to get through here. <laughs> so we're gonna look at the don't starve part and finding food. So here's a black cat chickadee. And this is, this is a picture I took it in, uh, you know, right around this time through the beginning of March. I'm not sure exactly what it is. And what's really neat here is you start to notice, and this is, isn't just for sugar maples here, but as the days, you know, when the days are getting above freezing starting in February and the nights are below freezing, that's when sugar maple sap's going to start running. It's also going to happen for other trees. And if there's any splits in any of the bark or there's any weeping, the sap's going to run out of the trees. And if you just happen to be sitting or walking or notice that, 
you might just want to watch that area because birds and other, and when it gets a little bit warmer, insects will come to this and the birds will eat the insects. But this is actually licking up the maple syrup sap right there. Uh, excuse, yeah, the maple sap right here. And I see woodpeckers coming to this, other birds coming to this. Uh, you'll notice it all of a sudden if you just see something dripping on the street, it could be from the tree that's running a lot of sap. So it's one good thing to, to look for here. But overall, like finding food, believe it or not, you know, and we'll talk about bird seed and bird feeding birds at the near the end. But a lot of insect, a lot of birds, even in the wintertime, they're still eating a lot of insects in different ways. Some rely exclusively on insects too. And so this kind of goes back of just kind of like stopping and noticing. So here's a picture of a chickadee I took a few years ago, um, right near a small little pond near a, a water pumping station off a, off of Route 140, a main route right here. And I didn't notice, you know, I took the picture and I looked at, at this later and I'm just gonna kind of go through this whole cycle here and see if you notice anything. So here's the chickadee going down right through here. And then it's picking at this right there. You can see right here. And then it starts to pull out something. And as I zoom in closer, you can see something orange. And then if you look at its beak, it's getting something orange stuck on its beak. So this is a cherry tree. We'll just go back to the beginning of the cycle. So what, what I want you to look at right here is this. And if you notice, it doesn't, it's just a very nondescript bump on the cherry right there. And again, so the chickadee puts his beak in here and it pulls something out. And believe it or not, that's probably a fly or a wasp. That's the larva. It's in a gall. These are closer up pictures of gall midgets. So these would be flies. They're basically baby or larval flies right here in their larval stage right through here. And you may see these also on oak leaves. You'll see these other galls here. But there's insects that are living in these, either in different stages of metamorphosis. You know, maybe they're spending the overwintering to become, in this case, these are going to be, uh, I believe, wasps. But flies will do this. This can also be bacteria that would be independent of not having anything to live there, but other types of um, insects. And so, I mean, just the things that we're constantly missing, like I didn't even, you know, I'm supposed to look for these stuff, but just even these little bump on, a, on the branch that looks just like part of the branch there is where the chickadee was getting uh, some food right through there. And it's moving around. So just as you start to like look a little closer, you know, even if it's just the feeders, there's all these little kind of like, kind of a natural history mysteries are just like a little bit more of, of stories and stuff like that that are really neat. Because these galls are all over the place. There's many different species. Wasps are probably the most diverse living thing, animal in the entire world uh, in terms of insects. There's probably over three or four million species of just wasps because of this whole kind of pattern of uh, them making these galls and eating the plants. And then there's wasps that eat the wasps that are in the galls. And then there's wasps that eat the wasps that, are, that eat the wasps in the galls right through here. Um, when I was doing a little bit of research uh, down in Belize on, on native bees, there was a colleague and a friend who was a professor at the, uh, over in Japan and for his undergraduate research, his PhD research. He was in the rains forest in Laos, and they found over 700 species that were not known to science of leaf mining caterpillars that would be inside the middle of the leaves. And each one of those caterpillars probably had a species of wasp that attacked just that one, and that, that probably had a species of wasp that attacked the wasp that attacked the caterpillar. So right there, there's 2,100 species that were not known, just as an example, through there. So it's really just kind of fascinating. So how many people have trouble finding their keys? <laughs> okay, right? You know? And then so, think of bird brains, they're having trouble finding things <laughs> through here. And think of like having trouble finding, you know, your keys, well, let's say not your keys, but trying to find food in this. I took this, this I, went, I did a little bit of snowshoeing when I was sitting at the computer too long this, uh, this afternoon, and I went out here. And so think of a bird trying to find food in this area. And then think of also, you know, one of the part of the talk and what people are interested in, how can I feed the birds right through here? So this is a picture of a red-breasted nuthatch. These are occasional 
winter residence depending on the year and what the seeds are doing up in say uh, Canada, New, uh, New Hampshire, or in the New England. This is a picture from a few years ago when we had lots of red-breasted nuthatches here. But the reason I like this picture, it's hard to see, but right there is at least one probably white pine or red pine seed. It, it's in a white pine or red pine forest. And there's probably more seeds in here. And it was going up and down this tree pulling seeds out of the bark. Because what the nuthatch was probably doing, I didn't ask it, it didn't answer. <laughs> it was probably, it had probably hidden seeds there earlier in the year or earlier in the season, and I was going back to, to find them. And so, their chickadees, in particular, along with other birds, they, they make seed caches. They'll collect seeds and they'll hide them all throughout the woods. Uh, kind of like stocking up for winter, right through there, okay? So, for our memory, but also for birds' memory, there's a part of our brain called the hippocampus, and in a specific part of that, it's where we do a lot of spatial remembering, like remembering where things are, where, you know, patterns where, where, where things might be. This is a picture not of a black-capped chickadee, but of a mountain chickadee uh, where this research was done. So knowing that, there's been research going on through here, basically, do chickadees with larger brains, and specifically this part in the hippocampus, survive and reproduce more? So what the research did, what the researchers did, and I'm going to kind of walk through this whole experiment is, in, is really amazing. They, on the back of the chickadee's leg right here, I'm going to show two bands, but you'll see this red band right through there. And I mean, just earlier today, um, somebody went to that door, put a key card up, and opened the door, and it opened up. So an RFID chip in the key cards, or just think of key cards that you might use. There's an RFID chip that's on that chickadee's leg, right through here, along with this band right through here. And these are eight bird feeders that are in the woods that they put up in Alaska. And so they fill them all with bird seed. They catch a bunch of chickadees in mist nets safely. They're basically, it's a, it's a, it's a kind of a, a net that looks similar to what you might put over uh, blueberries or something else to prevent birds or other things from eating it. The birds fly into that. They're gently taken out of that. There are different scientific measurements taken. And they put a little tag on it that's green with a number that goes on with the bird. And then that other tag that's an RFID chip. They put these feeders up in, the, in the, uh, the woods. This is in Alaska. There's also Missoula, also in Kansas and Colorado and a few other sites. And they just leave it open. Food's very scarce, so the chickadees get used to going to the bird feeders over, let's say, a week. After a week, this is where the seed comes out. So when the bird lands here, let's say a black oil sunflower seed comes out here and they eat it. After a week, only one bird feeder will open for the chickadee instead of all eight. Here's all eight of them right through there. And so what they looked at is when the birds flew in, how long did it take them to learn to go to the right feeder and how many mistakes did they make right through there? So a bird that would make less mistakes, let's say it always remembered going to this feeder, they thought that must have a better spatial memory, memory a larger hippocampus. A bird that went to three each time made more mistakes, a smaller hippocampus right through there. So what they found, like, what they found was that birds that have a better memory were more likely to survive and reproduce the following year. So they checked, they followed them along for over a year and looked at their nests, look how many bird, babies survived, and fledged right through there. And again, just to dye this in, this is the picture I took during the blizzard. Think of trying to find food in this in Alaska. That's my daughter. That's my three-year-old daughter, Serena, right there. So bring this back again to the chickadees. You can, you know, you can kind of relate to this right now through here. So here are the study, and I don't normally put a lot of graphs in here, but it's just so amazing to see this. So again, Fairbanks, Alaska, British Columbia, Prince George, Missoula, Fort Collins, and then Kansas right through here. And so you can see the pattern. Bigger to smaller, larger to smaller right here, larger to smaller right here. And so what this is, this is the Alaska one right here. When they looked at a select sample of the chickadees' brains right here, they were substantially larger hippocampus in Alaska and substantially more neurons in the Alaska birds than they were in the Kansas birds. And you can see that along the range. Because there was no food pressure in Kansas. It was easy to find food, so the, the birds could 
the birds didn't need to remember where their food was because it was everywhere, just as an example right here. And you can see this here. This is a cross-section of the bird's brain right through here in Alaska and in Kansas. Look at the difference right through there. Um, I'm not going to worry about the other side of the gra graph with the common garden experiment. And the same thing with the neurons. Substantially more neurons and connections between the bird's neurons in Alaska than in Kansas because there, there was a pressure on them for finding food. So when you look at your white-breasted nuthatches, this is another bird that will kind of cache or hide food around the forest, or you look at the chickadees, one of the ways that they're able to remember this and find their food, they've been shown, is actually seeing their spatial memory being different uh, within their brain inside the hippocampus. And it's just a, such a fascinating story that this research is still ongoing there, uh, through there. And it's, it's a neat way that they can actually, uh, I mean, it's amazing that they can put little tags on the bird's legs and they will open and close the bird feeders right through there. They're like that. So moving on to food, let's look at birds like robins and other birds that you might see around here. So this is a picture of a robin that I took in January a few years ago. Uh, it's getting juniper fruit, cedar fruit that you can see the little blueberries on this right there. This is the example. There's a flock of you know, 50 to 100 right through there. And then, you know, we start to get into March. You'll see, especially if you're walking through the woods or any area with lots of leaves, you'll see robins picking up and throwing the leaves around. <laughs> okay? And what's happening there is there's lots of food hidden in the leaves. Like, it's really good if you leave the leaves on the ground because lots of insects and other things can survive in the weeds. In the leaves right through there, and so the robins, and this goes for the vast majority of birds that you're going to see in the spring, summer, and fall, they're getting their protein and lipid sources through insects. Like um, baby birds need the protein from insects and other sources, not from seeds for most species to survive uh, and fledge and go through the new generation. Now there's a lot less insects that are active, very few. So what you see here is you see a switch to fruit. Fruit, fruit, and more fruit, and you can see that with the robins right through here, and with this picture. But the problem with that is insects and fruit get digested in completely different ways. You know, think of like, you know, like the skin of an apple or, or you know, like the fibrous nature that what you need to do to digest that and the slower digestion and everything like that. Which brings me to this bird. And I'm going to tie this all together through this bird. This is a yellow-rumped warbler. This is a migratory bird. It's down. It, it's migrated south for the winter here. But this is one of the first birds to migrate north in the spring and one of the last birds to migrate south in the winter. This is a picture I took in October just in a parking lot. I happened to look up and it was there. And you can see it tucked into the red maple leaves right through there. And this bird, this is just a pic, another picture of that titmouse, this bird when it migrates and when it feeds its young, is exclusively doing that through caterpillars. So you can see this is another warbler right here. Okay, this is a magnolia warbler. It's got a caterpillar in its mouth, and now the caterpillar is right there. And then here's just another view of it right through here of the caterpillar. And this, this bird will migrate through Quincy as well, too. This is a magnolia warbler. But in the fall, there's a lot fewer insects here when it's migrating back, because this again will go back weeks to a month later through here. And here it is again in the fall right through here. So here's the yellow warbler warble in the spring going to the owl blossoms here. And then here it is later in the fall. You can see how its, it's colors change and everything like this. And you can see it's on this vine right here that's um, hairy. If you see a vine that's hairy anywhere, don't touch it. It's poison ivy. Oh. And what this bird is doing right here is it's eating the poison ivy berries later in the year and surviving on those in the fall. These are pictures that I took um, a few years ago right through here. And what's really amazing is its digestive system lengthens in the fall. It actually physically gets longer and the food process is slower and it changes its way. Its body produces different digestive enzymes because poison ivy, has anybody ever had poison ivy fruit? It's really hard to digest. I'm just kidding. I've never had any. I'm just saying. <laughs> 
but it's super, super waxy, like bayberries, you know, you can think of it, you see, but it's a super waxy, it's super hard to digest, so not many birds can digest it. Because its digestive system changes, both physically and also the way it's digesting it, it that's why it migrates, is able to migrate later, because it actually transitions in its migration, and at the end of the, the, the its uh, kind of breeding season, to actually process completely different foods, going from insects, to fruit, which brings the same thing back to the robin that we were talking about. So when you're looking at this, and everybody th th thinks of robins and worms and everything like that, its digestive system, I'm not, this, it doesn't lengthen or anything like that with the run, but its digestive system does change so it can process stuff that's more protein rich in this way versus stuff that's more carbohydrate and kind of like waxy fruit rich right here. So it's actually, it's, it's, it's whole kind of physiology changes between the seasons as you're looking to, as, as they're looking to feed and survive through these seasons. So, you know, some birds, their brains will change. Oh, and the best thing about the chickadees, in the spring and summer, their hippocampus gets smaller. So it doesn't stay large the whole time, because in, in the spring and summer, it doesn't need to be big, so it takes the energy investment out of the, the brain there, gets small, and then in the winter, it builds back up those connections. I left that part out, I'm sorry. I'm going to talk about bird feeding in a, in, in a second that both with seeds and stuff but also with how you manage your yard and what you can do to that because birds in the past 50 or so years the population of birds was two to three billion larger 50 years ago and there's been about a loss of two to three billion birds within those 50 years and there's a lot of things you can do for the birds locally just in your yards or within the community with, with, with the way that you um, manage kind of like grass and open space and stuff like that that I'm more than happy to talk about. And then one last winter thing before I start talking about food is cold feet, which is really good around Valentine's Day right through here. <laughs> okay, so you can see the ducks right here. Have you ever thought of going out after the talk and going standing in the snow barefoot? or standing on ice that has a little bit of water above it barefoot, oh, sure. <laughs> go do that and your feet will be amputated because you'll get frostbite pretty quickly. So how in the world do ducks and other birds, and think of also the ducks swimming in, I just got a picture from a, a colleague today from I think Hingham Harbor or you know Quincy or whatever with all the ice flows in there with plenty of ducks in there. Yeah. You know, their feathers are, no water gets through the feathers for, for two reasons, but it's, you know, it's how basically they're connected and overlap. So the water can't get through, plus there's some oils involved in here. But the feet don't have feathers on them right through there. So how, is this, how does this happen? And I just want you to kind of give you a new appreciation when you see this. So this is a wonderful picture, uh, illustration by David Sibley uh, through here. And you can see here's the gull's foot right here. And then in this part right here, is the blood coming down into the foot and then going back up. And what's happening here is as the blood is traveling down the leg, the heat is actually transferred over because there's a webbing that kind of goes through that mixes together. And as the heat tra transfers over, the blood going back up as it comes in the leg. So as the blood gets farther and farther down the foot, it gets colder and colder because all the heat is transferred back to the other part of the leg before it gets down to the bottom of the foot. So when you get down to the bottom of the foot that's actually nice, you may be at one to three degrees Fahrenheit, uh, excuse me, Celsius. So about 33, 34, 35 degrees Fahrenheit above the leg. And the foot itself has very little muscle tissue in there. So there's very little need for it to stay warm. So all the heat is basically kept in the leg because of the way that the artery and vein and the capillaries between them are mixed together so the heat just flows right back up the leg and never gets cold. This happens, believe it or not, this happens in our arms and our hands a little bit too, but it's, you know, it's really shown um, with this picture right here. And here, because I mean they're standing in freezing, you know, 33 degree water, but while this part of the foot, the web foot right here, might be at one to two degrees, right up here is at 33, 34 degrees Celsius, you know, so 90, you know, high 90s in terms of Fahrenheit, which is just a really kind of a nice thing, uh, give you a nice appreciation um, for these incredible adaptations in the birds. 
So now just a little bit about bird feeding here. And what I wanted to start off here is Cornell and the, lab, the Cornell Lab of Ornithology has lots of uh, web cameras that are live. This one's live right now if it plays uh, at Cornell. And you can actually see the feeders right through here. I was watching it this last night as I was getting prepared for the talk and a flying squirrel flew in and started eating <laughs> chips. Here's another one. This is, a, this is a great one and I can talk about this more too. This is a great horn owl nest. We, we have lots of great horn owls in Quincy in the surrounding area. This is live right now and unless something happens she'll be sitting on her egg, one egg. That's her right there. And this, and this is live so this is, this is happening right now. Right through here. And you, you can see, and you can go, I, I can't do it with the way this is presented, but you can go back and see when the male and female, they move and they get around. But it was on one egg yesterday here, and this is just at a, above a golf course in Savannah. That's, a, that's an abandoned bald eagle nest uh, right through here. But here's one from Ontario, and this is, a, this is, a, this is, this is just a, a video of something that happened earlier, where you can see the birds coming to the feeders right through here. But if you look at Cornell feeder cams or Cornell cameras, you can see those right through there. And those, these are, these are, this is in Ontario, so those are gross beaks. Um, and you can see their bills are really well dead. That's a red pole, a really well dead. We won't have these down here, but I like this video just to see, to show you that. Okay, so types of bird seed that you can use. So birds can really benefit from uh, bird seed in the winter time. Uh, in the spring, summer, and fall, it's going to be supplemental at best because they're mostly looking for insects at the point. That doesn't mean there's anything wrong with feeding them. But it can be kind of complicated when you go to stores and see everything. Black oil sunflower seeds are the best. You can buy them in bags. They're relatively inexpensive. The shells are really cheap. So that's what this part is right here. The, uh, excuse me, the, the, they're relatively inexpensive as well too. The thin shells are easy to crack open. They've got a high fat content. And they're preferred by most birds, from chickadees, nuthatches, tips, tip mice, finches, sparrows, blue jays, and woodpeckers. You'll also see in the stores, there's also mixes, but safflower seeds, those are good for cardinals. Those are harder to crack, so they're not used as by many other birds. But you'll see safflower seeds sold individually, too. Then you'll see thistle, but now, because thistle's an invasive plant, uh, they typically won't sell that. And they use something that's similar called niger. And that's where you'll get, that's the very thin, small seeds. You saw that in the video with the Carolina wren. There were some in there. But that looks very similar to thistle, and that's great for American goldfinches. And then here's the dark-eyed junco right here. These will feed on the ground. Other things that are, that are still fine but not as good are millet. That's good for ground-nesting birds, uh, including juncos, cardinals, and sparrows that you can see there. And then peanuts. Uh, and if I'll show you the, I'll come back to this too if people are writing things down, but I'm just going to show you this, this live one. This feeder right here is completely full of peanuts to the top and blue jays and other birds love it. And they're full peanuts, so you can get cracked peanuts and everything through there. Those are good for the larger birds. You can see this feeder here, it's just an open tray. I'm going to show you the types of feeder. So here's like a tray feeder that can work really well. This is actually uh, some fat with seeds all mixed into it to look like a snowman that's hung up through there. And then here's a tube feeder right here that you can see that's kind of characteristic of many feeders that has a mix of millet and other things in it right through there. And I think they, I'm not sure about this one, there might be peanut butter and other things hidden within that one. Oh, sorry, hold on. Let me just get back to this one. So black oil sunflower seed is typically the best for winter birds. Uh, and you can find that in most places right through there. And then the last thing left off is suet. So suet, it, one, one that works really well in the wintertime that's really beneficial is just beef suet and it's just a white block that you'll hang in a suet feeder and there doesn't need to be any seeds in there because one of the limiting resources in the winter are fats and that suet is really good for birds. You'll also see it commonly sold uh, caked in with a lot of seeds kind of kind of packed into it. That's not as good but it's still, it's still good but the, the, the uh, the white fat uh, beef suet is a really good one. And then the three main types of feeders are tray feeders. So something, it's been very simple, just as an open tray right through here. Like a hopper feeder, and all that means is you open the top and you pour seeds into it and they come out on a tray on the bottom. 
And then the, the characteristic tube feeders right through here that you can see in this picture here. You can see one that has peanuts in it, one that has black oil, sunflower, and safflower seeds primarily in it. And then this one's that niger or thistle right through there. And then a little thing about feeder placement, too, is windows are really dangerous for birds. So if you, if you want to look at it from your window, it's best to have the feeder within like a, a foot or two or three feet from the window because then if a bird hits the window, it's typically not flying too fast, so it won't die. If you have it farther away from the window, they're more likely to come in too fast and, and not see the window and hit it that way. That's why window feeders are really good um, that, you know, that attach to the window are ones that are, because they see the feeder, so they're not gonna miss the feeder and fly full speed into the window. Or if, they, if they're landing at the feeder and miss the, you know, don't see the window, they're gonna hit it at a slower speed. When it's you know, three to 10 feet away, they could come in and miss it as they're flying away from it and hit it. Um, but one thing, people will put feeders out too in their yard and be like, birds never come to it. It could be because it's not a good yard for birds or other reasons, but if there's nothing for them to hide in, uh, they're less likely to visit. So if you had shrubs or trees, especially evergreens in the wintertime that were close vicinity, that would allow the bird to come to the feeder and go eat the food kind of in a safe, protected area through that. Because at the beginning, you saw the picture of the red-tailed hawk. Like, bird feeders are going to attract the smaller birds, but they're also going to attract hawks and other animals that might eat the smaller birds, because that's, that's the way that they eat. So if they're able to hide in cover through there, that's why it's good to have it kind of close to shrubbery and uh, other, other vegetation or places for them to hide. And then it's, it's always good, you know, you can do it a little less in the wintertime, but to make sure you're keeping it clean because the bacteria and stuff can travel and form through there. Another thing to keep in mind is also water sources, especially in the wintertime, because that can really save a bird's life, uh, depending on the year. Mm -hmm. So heated bird baths can be really beneficial in different ways through there. Um, in the wintertime, you can really uh, provide uh, help for birds there. And then lastly, if you kind of think of a holistic view, and this could be even if you're, you know, depending on your apartment, house, yard, community garden through here, you know, is how do you provide food, water, and shelter for birds like for, you know, kind of year round? And you can kind of, you know, this, I'm just going to go through this kind of quickly. If you have more questions or interests, I can give you some resources. But you want to think of like what just, assess like whatever area you're trying to attract more animals to, whether it's your yard, community garden, maybe it's adding planters or anything through that. But how can you create a more bird friendly habitat, you know, in terms of like variety of flowers and plants, structures, water sources through here. You know, so like here, here's, here's my front garden at my house um, in Mansfield from last year. So this is just a small suburban street. Uh, it's a pretty small yard, but I use a lot of planters right through there. There's a water source. You could, oh, that, that's, that's a bird bath that broke. That's, that's filled with a plant right there. But there's some water sources that are tucked in here. But, I use, but you can use planters. I have, a, I, have a, I have a blueberry bush that's planted at a planter here, depending on what you have in terms of the yard here. Here's just another view of it later on in the season. This is bee balm. There's also a lot, there's about, there's a lot of different species in here. A lot of the plants I plant are native. So once, it's a, it was a lot of work getting it set up, but once they, I don't do anything in the summertime. I don't even water. Um, I kind of do all my work in the spring and then just let it go. Because since the plants are native and adapted for the environment, this is a species of bee balm, they typically will do well unless there's like a severe drought in here as well. So by having like native plants in different ways, this is just a picture from the Xerxes Society, you know, you can really provide a lot of benefit for local birds and local wildlife because these become the bird feeders right through here. And the reason I like this, this picture is there's a lot of diversity of plants, but see there's like lots of heights and structures and places for them to hide and, and that it's really nice in that respect there as well too. Because these type of plants are gonna provide lots of food so you can see there's, there's a Cranesville geranium and then there's a caterpillar. And then here's a picture that I took of a warbler two years ago on a cherry tree in Canton. And what this is doing right here, mm -hmm. it's going, and this is a different species in that same tree from a little while later. It's looking for insects. And what's really neat here is you can actually see the bird, as I go through these pictures, watch the bird use its beak as tweezers because it's eating insects in here. 
and see it, it opens its beak right here. This is a Nashville warbler. And it's actually opening and closing and manipulating the flowers to get those insects out of the leaves right through here. And I'm going to come back to the chickadee again. And you can see the chickadee's got a caterpillar in its beak right here. This is just a, a crab apple tree. And then also, I get hummingbirds coming to my yard every day, right through there, coming to the different plants to feed on them. And if we think back to this picture of the chickadee, too, here's a picture of a chickadee nest. They nest in nest boxes. This is a nest box we have in Canton. There's five chickadees in here. So this is, these are about a day or two old. One, two, three, the egg is four, and the fifth egg is underneath here. Um, and this is their nest within a nest box. And then here's what their nest looks like. Wood, oh, did you know chickadees act like woodpeckers? So a really soft dying tree, they actually excavate the tree out. Uh. The, and if you're near water and you hear chickadees and they're around, but they're not making much noise, and it sounds like they're talking to one another, like really, really quiet, like clicks or chirps, but like really quiet, just stop and watch them because that's how I found this one. They're probably making a nest in the springtime near the water. But the reason I bring these pictures up here is, here's a baby chickadee about to fledge. How many insects do these chickadees need, these five chickadees need, to live those three weeks they're in the nest, the four weeks in the nest? And just being imagined the graduate student in Delaware who had to count every chickadee visit. <laughs> they did this in a town like Quincy or Mansfield, but in Delaware, it's Doug Tallamy's work and his graduate students. They actually counted. They need, on average, to successfully raise these five chickadees between six and 9,000 insects. Oh, <laughs> Over three weeks from the two parents, or four weeks, depending on the time in the, in the nest right through there. But just to give you a sense, think of how many trips that's going to be. <laughs> It's going to be 9,000 if it's one at a time. But you know, you get the idea. Like It's an incredible amount. And one of the reasons they think birds driving bird decline is, is because when you look at this crab apple, but an easy thing to think of is a, is a Florida dogwood tree. It's a native dogwood tree. I don't know the graphic of it there. That species of dogwood has 250 to 300 caterpillars and other insects that eat the leaves. If you look at a kozu dogwood, looks very similar, same type. That probably has zero to five insects that eat the leaves there. Because it's, 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 it's not, it, it doesn't have an evolutionary history with the insects that live here. If you look at a native oak tree, can have upwards of 600 different species of insects that eat the leaves, lots of food for the birds. A nori maple, for example, maybe 30 or 40 species of insects. So much greater difference. So by providing like habitat, you know, like, like I showed right here, on a smaller level, not only are you, you know, do the flowers look nice and I might get uh, hummingbirds coming to it, but there's a lot of stuff that's eating this. Not too much, because you can see how, what is it, which means there's lots more food for birds right there, which means like the chickadees are more likely to get, collect enough food and raise enough, you know, to, to fledge a full nest as opposed to a partial nest right here. So like having like a diversity of plants in both like how when they're blooming and how big they are, but also like what, you know, like here's a blueberry bush, here's some New Jersey tea, but different structures in there as well too. And like these you can plant in planters depending on what you have. New Jersey tea you can plant in planters. And then here the titmouse can get the six, seven, or eight caterpillars that it needs. Or in the fall, the cedar waxwing, there might be fruit for it to come by and get that there as well in that, in that crab apple tree through there. So that's a little bit about bird feeding. And I just wanted to thank you so much for your kind attention to um, this, this evening's talk. And if you have any questions, I'd be more than happy to answer them. So thank you.